in terms of what some of these risk factors are, well, there's a number of things we have to think about when it comes to atopic dermatitis. These are things that sometimes they're academic discussions, but sometimes these are directly relevant to our ability to diagnose and sort of um, counsel patients and, and caregivers as to what they should expect for their you know, family member or for their own disease. We know there are strong associations with family history of atopy. If one parent has um, uh, atopic dermatitis or atopy, there's a significantly increased risk of their child having it. But if both parents have it, you get a three to five fold higher risk of their child getting atopic dermatitis. We know about the loss of function mutations in the filaggrin gene, and that's the one that's been most consistently shown across studies and may be associated particularly with earlier onset or more severe persistent disease, um, and potentially even with some comorbidities such as eczema herpeticum. But even then, the majority of patients don't have the filaggrin mutations. There's other genetic mutations that likely occur, but though not nearly as well reproduced across studies. So it seems like atopic dermatitis is fairly monogenic in a small subset, but is probably polygenic uh, in, in uh, the larger population. In terms of associations we've seen in the United States, associations in kids with African-American race, where African-American children may have up to double the prevalence of atopic dermatitis than their Caucasian counterparts. And then we also know that across many studies internationally, there seems to be an association with higher parental education, really for reasons not fully understood, that may be in part confounding due to metropolitan living, and urban living certainly has been uh, something that has shown associations with atopic dermatitis. There are other uh, things that have been shown as well in terms of just uh, patients who live on farms may have lower rates of atopic dermatitis. There may be some studies have shown protective effects of pet exposures. Some have shown potentially harmful effects of pet exposures. So I think there's still a lot of these different risk factors that we, we need, really need to sort out when we're thinking about how to properly prevent the disease. And, and I'm, just, I'm curious, Steve, you know, um, which of these do you sort of encounter the most and, and, and you know, incorporate into your clinical decision-making the most? 